So, uh, so I'm going to talk about adding. Um, you know, so it'll be a slow start because we probably all know how to add. Um, my uh, my friend Stephen tweeted this a while back. Um, if you're building a system for calculating aggregates and you don't know the relevance of things like abelian groups, stop. Um, what? <laughs> so uh, he's wrong. Uh, he's wrong in his sort of typical math snob way. But um, you know, I think he has a point. And, uh, and the way I would put it is that if you are building systems for calculating aggregates, if you're building stats and analytic systems, you probably do know the relevance of abelian groups. You just don't realize it yet. But it might actually be useful for you to not only implicitly understand it, but also sort of explicitly understand it. Um, so the too long don't read of this talk is, is first of all, adding is awesome. Um, and, uh, and we'll talk about the ways in which adding is awesome. And, and, and those might or might not be surprising to you. For a lot of you, probably they won't be too surprising, but, but it's useful to cover that ground. And then the second thing is that a lot of things that you probably don't think of as adding um, are adding in, in the ways that adding are awesome. And, and that's awesome, and that's useful. Um, and so hopefully that'll be surprising to, to a few more of you. So, as sort of a motivating example, I'm going to talk about um, StatsD or StatsD-like systems. Now, um, you know, if you don't know these systems, they're sort of observability or metric systems. Um, and, and in your code, they look kind of like this. So if you imagine, um, this is the entirety of Stripe's code base here. If you imagine uh, that Stripe's code base is, you know, we want to process a payment, and we're going to make this transfer. But before we do that, we just want to record how many monies are going through. Uh, and so we make a call like stats.increment, and, and we give it a name, and, and we give it an amount. And conceptually, what's happening is, is we're generating a stream of numbers, right? A stream of, of amounts going through the system, let's say. And that's getting sent out. In the case of StatsD, it's like over UDP, but it doesn't really matter. It's getting sent somewhere, and that somewhere has a magic addifier box, uh, and that's going to add it up, and, and at some point, we're going to get a total out of that. Right? So, so that's useful. Um, and, uh, and we can think about you know, how you might implement this kind of addifier box. Right? Um, and, uh, and this is kind of you know, ridiculous Ruby code, but that just kind of gets across the idea of what this thing might be doing. Right? It's going to start at 0. And every time you send it a number, it's going to take its, its current result, and it's going to add the number to it. Right? OK. Um, hopefully, you can all follow this so far. So, um, so this has a bunch of nice properties. And, and one nice property that I think is worth pointing out just from this code is that we are only needing to hold on to one thing, right? So we have this whole stream of numbers. And you could imagine an implementation where we just log every number. Um, but if we had a huge number of stats, then that would take up a bunch of storage. And so it's nice, actually, that, that addition has this property, that if what we want is the total, you know, if we have this stream of numbers coming in, we can actually just incrementally keep adding to, to this one value that we have to hold, right? So that box just has to have one number in it. So you know, that, that is a nice property. That is one of the ways in which addition is awesome. OK, um, let's talk about some other ways in which addition is awesome. So if all we're doing is, is what I just described, where we take this stream of numbers, and we, every time we get one, we add it to our current result, um, then, then this is sort of mathematically what we're doing, right? We're, we're first adding, let's say the stream of numbers is like 4, 8, 16, 23, 42. Right? Um, the, the first thing we're doing is adding 4 and 8, and then 15 comes along and we add 15. So it's kind of parenthesized like that. Right? Does that make sense? OK. Now, in real life, with something like StatsD, you don't just want the grand total normally. Normally, you want to track like how many, you know, what was the total for this minute or for this hour or something like this. And so you don't just have one box. You've, in fact, got a whole bunch of boxes. Right? You've got sort of a separate counter for 1201 than you do for 1202 and so on. Right? Um, and so if we imagine a system like this, you know, we might have the 4 and the 8 come at 1 minute, and the 16 and 23, and so on. And we have these boxes. Um, and these boxes all have that ridiculous Ruby code that I showed you. Um, but, and this is another you know, way in which addition is awesome, if we do, having separated it out into all of these individual minutes, want to know what the grand total is, we don't have to go back to the original stream of numbers. Right? We can just add up the subtotals. OK. Hopefully, you are all still following this. Um, so you know, mathematically, you can think of that as we're changing the way the parentheses are. 
right? Because when we're doing this, um, we are going from you know, the, the parenthesization I showed you before to here, where first we're adding 4 and 8, and then separately we're adding 16 and 23, and then at the end we're adding these. Um, and incidentally, you might have a minute where no events happen, right? And the way I wrote that code, you would end up with a zero. Um, and adding that in also doesn't change anything, right? We, we still come up with the right answer. OK, these are, these are good things. Um, so incidentally, you know, uh, mathematically, that's called associativity. Um, but, uh, you know, I'm trying not to be too mathy in this talk, so that, that might be advanced. So, okay, so, so let's say, you know, that, that your business grows and the number, you know, the, the, the transaction volume grows and you now need not just one magic stats collecting box, but several magic stats collecting box and you, you partition uh, the, the event stream across many of these, right? Um, so another way in which addition is awesome is that you can do that too. Right? So if you have some of your numbers going to one box and some of your numbers going to another box, um, you can then collect them uh, in one place and, well, you can add them up separately on each of those boxes and then collect them um, and, uh, and you still come up with the right answer, right? And so now not only have we changed the parenthesization, um, but we've also effectively changed the order in which we're adding these up, right? Um, and uh, and the, the Pink arrows there are, are the point there is that that's network traffic, right? So we've gone from sort of feeding the results of something into something on, on the same machine to feeding the results of something into, into a different machine. Um, and, and one of the you know, important properties here is that what we're sending over the network there is actually very small, right? Because we can do the total separately on each machine and then just send the total over the network. So, so that's a useful thing. So that's awesome. Um, and, uh, and of course, you can put it together, right? So you can have each machine be keeping separate counters for each minute or whatever, um, and multiple machines, and you still have very, very little network traffic, let's say, um, to get to the, the final machine that's going to add it all together, right? So, so these are ways in which addition is awesome, and, and we take advantage of these properties you know, all the time, and we build distributed systems um, so that we can efficiently you know, roll up aggregates, and, and we can efficiently distribute things over many machines, and, and we're not always going back to the street. OK, cool. Um, now, stats D or, or things like it, you're not just doing counts. You're not just doing additions. You know, another thing, another way your code might work, um, you know, StatsD often has, uh, the clients often have like a time method, right? So I want to know how long this took. Um, and let's say that one thing that we want to be tracking in our analytics is like, what's the longest it took, right? So we want to do a max. Oh, man, now we have to implement a whole other thing, a whole separate code path. Uh, we have to have, you know, another piece of Ruby code. By the way, I've, I've turned the box sideways so that you can tell that this is a magic maxifier, not a magic addifier box. Um, but actually, the code, the ridiculous Ruby code, looks almost identical. Uh, it's just that rather than adding to our result, we're, we're maxing with our result, right? It's still a binary operation. It's just we're using max instead of plus. And actually, all of these same things that I just went through apply to max too, right? So if you keep the max for a minute, you know, each minute, and then you max all of those together, you do get the total max. Um, it doesn't matter, you know, what order you do it in. You can keep sort of separate submaxes on each boxes and get the total max. Um, so you can end up with exactly the same diagram for max as you do with add. Well, that's kind of nice, right? That means that, you know, maybe you can implement some kind of abstraction in your system over, over multiple of these things and, and just implement it once, right? Um, so did someone just shout something? No, OK. Um, by the way, do feel free to heckle. I'm, I'm pro-heckler. So, um, you know, so how do we generalize that? Well, well, well let's sort of think through what, what are the properties here that we've been taking advantage of, right? So one property is that both add and max, both plus and max, uh, take two numbers and produce another number, right? Um, so that's useful because we want to just keep one thing in the box, right? We don't want to have to keep the whole list. We want to be able to reduce it down to just one thing. So, so that's nice. Another is that the way that we group it doesn't seem to matter, right? We can group it by minute or we can group the whole thing or whatever. Um, so that's associativity. Um, another is that the ordering doesn't seem to matter, right? We can distribute it across all these different boxes and end up adding things up in different orders and we still come up with the right answer. So that's commutativity. 
Um, another somewhat subtler but still somewhat important property is that zeros get ignored, right? So we can have one of our boxes can be empty, basically, but we don't have to treat it any differently. We can throw it in, and, and we still get to the right answer. Well, what other things have these properties the way that I've stated them? And, and it turns out almost nothing does, right? Not exactly like this. So, for example, if we consider min, right, which, which seems like it should be almost identical. And by the way, I'm, I'm assuming here that we're in positive integers because we were talking about timing data. So, um, so that's why zero works for max, right? But for min, if you min something with zero, you, you get back zero. You don't get back your thing, right? So zeros aren't ignored. So, so this isn't quite right. Um, but this is, when, this is when my math friend comes in and says, oh, well, obviously what you've got is a commutative monoid, right? I mean, duh. Um, and, uh, and it turns out, if you look it up, that, that he's right. So, so there is, uh, in, 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 in the field of abstract algebra and mathematics, there, there is a concept of something called a commutative monoid. And a commutative monoid looks almost exactly what, like what I just wrote up. So it is a set, some set S, and an operation, a binary operation. And the binary operation needs to take two members of S and produce another member of S, right? So great, take two numbers, produce another number. Uh, it has to be associative, it has to be commutative, and there has to be some identity element where if you take, say, you know, A and perform the operation with the identity element, you still get A back, right? So that's sort of our zero. Um, and, uh, and it turns out that there are a very large number of these, right? Um, and so the basic premise of this talk is that um, if you think of your analytic systems, of your, of your aggregation systems, in terms of commutative monoids, right, you can implement just one piece of infrastructure that is doing all the things I was talking about with bucketing by time and, and distributing over many machines and letting you do queries in, in any number of ways, um, but you only need one abstraction, uh, which is the commutative monoid, and, and that probably most of the things, if not all of the things, you're going to want to compute uh, over your stats can be represented this way. And that's, that's really not obvious. And, and I think um, you know, the, most of the rest of this talk is sort of talking through a few examples and showing how most things can be um, squeezed into that framework. Right? Um, so, let me start with, with this example, um, and, and I'm starting with this example because it's quite different from sort of plus and max in some ways, um, but, but is still useful. Um, and, and the idea here is um, it's, it's a top K. So, you know, let's say that you have, um, instead of just the, the amounts people are paying going through, you have like a transaction ID and the amount of the transaction ID, and you want to hang on to the top 10 transactions by, by amount for over whatever period of time you're looking at, right? Um, and so what you have going in are these sort of lists of, um, you know, say Alice spent $10, Bob spent $5 or whatever, and, and what you want to come out is just the top. In this case, we're doing a, a top two, right? So just the top two. Um, so you can read through the Ruby code. I don't know how, how obvious the Ruby code is going to be. It's also like not the most efficient implementation you could do. Um, but if you think about what's going on, right, if I have one, say, top two list, and you have another top two list, right, we can always combine them sort them, take the top two of that, and end up with the global overall top two list, right? And the way in which we get there doesn't really matter, right? Um, so if I switch the order around, we still come up with the right answer, right? If I change the grouping around, we still come up with the right answer. Um, we're always taking in top two lists in, or, or you know, maybe an empty list, which sort of acts as the identity here, um, and getting top two lists out, right? So, so this is in a completely right, I mean, if you, this is not numbers. This is some very different set. This is a set of lists of pairs of you know, IDs and, and numbers. Um, but it still has this, those same properties of commutativity, of, of associativity, um, and so we can still implement it as a monoid, and actually all of the code, if we've done our system right, that worked just for adding things up will also work for, say, computing a top 10, um, which is pretty cool. Um, my note here is, like, this implementation is actually really bad. You should just use a heap, but um, that would have taken more code to write. So. Um, Let's talk about something else. Let's talk about averaging, right? So that's a really common thing that you want to do. Um, so averaging seems at first like it doesn't work, 
right? Um, because the grouping, for example, like matters a lot on averaging. If, if, if what our box is doing is just a straight average operation, um, then, then this doesn't work because we're going to have, let's say that we take these three numbers and, and we now have that six. If we now average that six with something else, right, we're going to get the wrong answer, basically because that six isn't weighted appropriately, right? It, it, we don't have any way of recording the fact that that six represents like three items worth, right? Um, but we can think in a, in, in a different set, in a different space, right? And, and so instead of thinking before we, we do this operation, um, we can transform these numbers from just being individual numbers to being, let's say, pairs of number and count, right? Um, and now this is actually just addition again, right? So if we just do vector addition on these, um, then we get something which is the, the total and the count, and we can very easily from that, you know, we just divide to get the average back out, right? Um, and so, you know, this is, this is a pattern that, um, that's going to come up a lot in the talk of sort of transforming into another space. Uh, you have some monoid in that other space, um, and then you can get out the answer that you want, right? Um, Again, a sort of real life note here, you probably don't want to do it exactly this way um, because your, your sum is going to get huge, right? But there are numerically stable ways of, of computing averages that, um, that don't have that problem and that are still monoids, right? Are still commutative and associative. Um, another very quick example, right? You might want to compute histograms. Um, and so again, as your, as your data comes in, um, you can transform it, you can bucket it, and transform it into a vector. And so the idea here is that we have vectors from like 1 to 10. And so our 10, we're going to put a, a 1 count in the 10 spot. Or 5, we're going to put a 1 count in the 5 spot. And again, we're just doing element-wise addition here, right? Um, and so it's, it's all the good things we want it to be. And then we end up with a histogram that, that we can extract out and, and you know, use however it is we want to be using a histogram, right? Um, Hopefully that's all straightforward. Um, again, heckling questions, like if anyone wants to interrupt me, go ahead. Um, so, you know, I said that there was this pattern of, of kind of trans... Oh, question, yes. Uh, on the previous slide, shouldn't it have been 18 and 6? Uh, uh, oh, I'm sorry. Uh, no. So, so the idea here is that um, what we are trying to maintain is a, a vector with two elements, um, one of which is the total that we've seen, right, and one of which is the count that we've seen. And then what we want to get out of that is just the average, right? In the end, like the answer to our query should just be the, the average, should just be six. Ah, yeah, so that's a really good point, right? So we, we would never send this to another box, right? We would keep sending this along, um, and we would keep aggregating. If we're like aggregating and re-aggregating and doing all these roll-ups, we would stay in this space, right? And so we'd send 18.3 along to the other box. At some point when we actually want an answer to like show on a web page or something, only then would we transform into this. But that's lossy, right? So, so th at that point, that's just like for our consumption. That's not for, for the computer to keep, right, and, and to keep doing things with. So that's actually a really important point and, um, and, and brings me actually pretty nicely to this slide. So um, I switched to Java to sort of make the types clear, and, and hopefully that's like reasonable for people to read. But um, the, the sort of framework that I end up thinking about this a lot in is that you, know, you, you, you actually have three types involved. Um, you have your input type, um, you have your output type, and often those are the same. So in the case of average, like those are both like a single number, right? And then you have your, your, your S, your set S that you're actually doing these, these operations on. Um, and so you need to be able to prepare your input type to get it into the, into the S space, right? So you need this prepare that takes an I and returns an S. Um, you then need to be able to reduce in your S space, right? So you need to be able to take a left S and a right S and produce another S. Um, and then at some point, you're, you're going to want to present, right? You're going to want to take your, your S result, which might be in some kind of hard-to-understand form, um, like 18, 3 rather than 6, 
uh, and you're going to want to get your kind of human readable version out of that, right? And so you have your present that goes from S to O. Um, and the point of this diagram is exactly what we were just talking about, which is that um, you, you might have multiple, I mean, you in fact probably will, to make this interesting, have multiple layers of reduction, right? So you're going to feed in, um, you're going to reduce, you're going to take the output of that and then reduce again. You might send it to another box and then reduce again, and so on. But then eventually, at some point, you know, you're going to want to look at the answer, and then you're going to run it through present, right? Um, and so that's sort of, um, you know, both conceptually, but also like in practice, if you're like writing an interface in a system, you know, that's that's how I think of it, and and, and I think that's it's it's a reasonable framework for this stuff. Um, so let's talk about a, a, another example, right? So so another thing. Um, that you might want to do is, uh, is compute the number of unique values, right? Like the unique visitors to your site. Okay. So, um, so it's easy to think about this uh, in one way as, as, as a monoid, as, as something that has these properties, because um, all you have to do is transform from, from the individual visitors to your site into a set with just that visitor in it, um, and then you can use set union. Right? And set union uh, is a monoid. Set union commutes. Set union is associative. Right? Um, but set union has a problem. Right? Um, and, and the problem here is that it's unbounded in terms of the amount of space that we're going to take. Right? So although it satisfies all these mathematical properties, it doesn't really satisfy the system's properties that, that we kind of implicitly want here. And, and we sort of have. Um, it, it, I, I, I don't know of, although a better mathematician than me might know of some sort of mathematical term for this, but, but in computer science terms, right, we want to bound the space that any element in this set is going to take. Right? Um, and so although this, this kind of looks nice for, for small examples, this is going to horribly fall over um, for large examples. And, and so the question is, you know, can we do this um, in a way that has bounded space? Right? Um, and, and the answer is no, but we can estimate it in a way that has bounded space. And, and that turns out to be almost as good. And, and so some of you might have seen um, you know, this approach or things like it before, but, but I think a lot of you probably haven't, so I'll walk through it. So, um, so what happens if, um, when we're transforming into this space that we're going to reduce, uh, instead of using the item or, or a set of the item, we hash the item. We hash the item, let's say, to a number between 0 and 1. Okay. Um, what now? What, what can we do with that? Um, what can we do with that in particular that's going to let us get a, a number out at the end, which is the number of unique values that we had? Well, so we're hashing it to 0 or 1. Um, and if we think about the number line between 0 and 1, um, let's say that we have two unique values, as, as in that example, right? They're going to sit there and there on the number line. They're going to sit at some random point in the number line. And that random point is going to be, you know, just uniformly anywhere on the number line, right? I mean, if we've got a good hash function, then that's going to be true. Um, and so as we add more and more of these um, for some large n that we've, we've now got ticks on this number line, What's going to be the average distance between any two marks on that number line? Right? Um, so we've got 0, 1. We're, we're uniformly distributing a bunch of numbers across the space between 0 and 1. And what I want to know is uh, what's the distance between two of them? Right? Anyone? Um, yeah, so 1 over n. Or actually, I think it turns out to be 1 over n plus 1. Right? Um, but the thing is, it's, 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 a, it's a pretty simple thing, actually, right? Um, and that's the average distance between any two of those, which means it's also the expected distance between 0 and the first one, right? Um, and that's the really interesting thing, because that means that if we just take the min uh, of all of the hashes, then what we can do to get the estimate back out is just 1 over e minus 1. We just reverse that um, expectation of 1 over n, and we get an estimate. Now, that's probably not going to be that good an estimate, right? There's, there's a lot of randomness involved here. There's a lot of probability for error here. Um, but we can do it n times, right? And so if instead of just keeping one hash and taking the min over that, we keep a large number of hashes, 100 hashes, 1,000 hashes, um, and, uh, and we do an element-wise min over these vectors, 
and then we average it at the end, then actually we get something out um, that is a very good estimate, right? And um, there's an algorithm that, that is sort of a, a, an, an optimization of this that has a bunch of sort of compression tricks and a bunch of tricks to make it more accurate called hyperloglog -log that you might have heard of. Um, but basically, more or less, this is what hyperloglog -log is doing. Um, and exactly this, incidentally, is something called um, min hash signature, which, which also has a bunch of uses. So um, in real life, you'd use hyperloglog -log if you wanted to compute unique values. You'd use min hash, um, gives you a bunch of uh, nice sort of set similarity estimation. Um, bloom filters are also almost this, right? You can think of bloom filters as being sort of a vector of zeros and ones where you're taking, doing a vector uh, max operation on them, right? They're, they're actually very similar and, and composed in this way for set membership. But these are all basically the same idea, just tweaked for sort of different error rates. And hyperloglog, -log, I think, if you keep a 1K counter, right, if that's the size of your vector, um, I think it's about 2% error. Um, which is pretty good, and you can, you can easily get it down to lower error just by allocating more, right? Um, and so the thing to remember about this that's interesting, right, is that this works in all of those architectures and all of those ways that we were looking at before in addition, right? So, you know, you're used to thinking, or, or I think most people are used to thinking about unique values as being something that you can't aggregate like that, right? If I've got a bunch of daily unique values and I want monthly unique values, I've got to kind of go back to the source data. But if what you've got is a bunch of hyperloglog -log counters for your daily uniques, then you can just max all of those together, or min all of those, or, or whatever it is that you're doing, um, and then sort of run it through the present step and get out your estimate, right? So you can get much more efficient sort of online querying or, or, or you know, batch roll-ups and so on um, of things like unique values. Um, so, so that's pretty cool. Um, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go through uh, one more example kind of like this, and, and then uh, hopefully there will be time for questions. So, um, so what about frequency, right? So we were talking about like unique number of uniques, but what about if we want to know how often, say, a particular IP address shows up in the stream or something like this, right? Um, so again, you know, we could just um, have these, you know, hash tables or whatever, right? These maps from um, from the, the IP address or the visitor to account, and, and we can sum those up, and, and that works. Um, and that works fine, um, again, if you've got a small number of unique keys that you're trying to track the frequency of, right? But it has the same problem that it has unbounded space. Um, and so can we come up with a way, a similar way, of having something that, that still is a monoid, that has bounded space, um, and that we can use in our analytic systems to track frequency. Um, well, you know, we, the last time what worked was hashing, and, and so maybe we can use hashing again here. Um, and, uh, and so what if, um, as the items go through, um, we hash them to a bucket? Um, so we take the hash, and, and then we, uh, you know, we, we run modulus to find some bucket of some fixed size vector that we've got, right? Um, and we have to be de de bucketing these hashes because, you know, we're, we're, we're sort of what we want. We want more than what we had before, right? We can't just, like, take the min over these hashes if we're just going to get unique values, right? But, but, but maybe we can, we can sort of project it down into this smaller space, right? Um, and so, you know, in this case, um, we can hash Alice to, to you know, the, the third bucket there. We can hash Bob to the second bucket. Um, Alice gets hashed to the third bucket again, and so we add these up, and, and now we could see um, if we wanted to query at the end, we could, we could hash Alice and see that there was a two in that column, and so that's right, Alice appeared twice, or we could hash Bob and see that there was a one. Um, this also has an obvious problem, right? Um, and, uh, and that problem is collisions, right? Um, so what if Charlie also hashes to the third bucket? Um, so now we have a problem because we're going to end up with three. And so we, when we go to do our query, we're going to hash Alice and we're going to look in that bucket and we're going to see Alice is three, not two. That, you know, that's like a 50% error. That's pretty bad, right? Also, if we hash Charlie, we're still going to get three. Um, and that's even worse because what we're expecting to get from Charlie is one, um, and in fact, what we're getting is, is three. Um, and so that's, that's really bad. Um, 
But we can fix it actually in sort of a similar way to the way that we fixed the sort of bad estimate um, with unique values, which is we can use multiple hashes. Um, and, and the way this works is there's a data structure called account min sketch, um, where instead of those vectors, as I showed you, uh, you have a matrix. So you have several vectors, and each vector uses a different hash function, right? And so um, in the first row, uh, we're going to hash Alice, let's say, to the third column, and so we've got two Alices. In the second row, Alice is going to be hashed somewhere else. In the third row, Alice is going to be hashed somewhere else, right? So as these come in, um, we get, you know, we, we, we have one hash function for each row. We get these, you know, n positions that where we're going to increment, and we do that. Um, Charlie comes along, and you can see in the first row, Charlie collided with Alice, and so we've incremented that to three. Um, but in other rows, you know, the more rows you have, the less probability that there is that there's going to be a collision in all of them, right? So in other rows, Charlie is not going to collide with Alice. Um, and then again, you know, maybe Bob comes in and Bob collides somewhere else, but not in the first row or whatever. Um, and so in the end, when you want to know what's the value for Alice, you look at all of Alice's hash, hash positions, and you take the minimum, right? Um, and that is going to be, it's, it's an upper bound, right? It's certainly possible that there were collisions there, um, but it's going to be sort of the best upper bound that we have. Um, and so if you do this, again, it's sort of surprising how good this ends up being as an estimate. And so I think it's something like, again, if, if you're willing to sort of have a matrix that's like, you know, a few, like 500 by 5 or something, right, you know, fits into, into a couple of K, um, you'll be within 2%, right? So you're gonna, your, your, your real value is going to be somewhere between what you have, what you get, and like 2% less than that. Right? So, um, so it's really not that bad. Um, and again, these errors, right, as you combine, no matter how many of these you combine, no matter how much you keep aggregating and re-aggregating and re-aggregating, these errors don't go down. Right? So it's still 2%. So if you have these estimates daily, and then you want to add them all up monthly, and then you want to add all those monthly ones up yearly, or whatever it is, and then you want to add that across, you know, you're, you, you've got to segment it some other way, and you want to add it up, you know, that, that error rate, that relative error rate, right, um, stays the same. Um, one, one problem worth pointing out in this one is that it doesn't actually maintain a list of the keys, right? So you can't go and ask this, like, what's the highest one and get a key back. You have to know what the key is and put that in and get an answer. Um, and so often this is, kept, this is paired with something else that is maintaining, like, a list of interesting keys um, that we can then feed into this to, to get the answers out, right? Um, a couple more points I want to make before questions. Um, one is that in that tweet at the beginning, it mentioned abelian groups, and I still haven't said anything about abelian groups. Um, and that's, that's really because um, this talk is about addition, not about subtraction, because uh, that's a whole other talk. But um, to kind of give you a very brief abstract algebra overview, there's, there's sort of at least three kind of you know, increasing, you can think of this almost like an inheritance hierarchy. And at the top, you've got semigroups, um, which have a set and some associative binary operation, right? Monoids are like semigroups, but they add the identity, right? The, the zero element. Um, groups are like monoids, but they also add an inverse. So you have to be able to take any element and from that element get an inverse element that when you add, you know, sort of add those two together, they cancel each other out. Right, um, which, is, which is really to say subtraction. Um, and any of these can be commutative, and in practice, at least in this kind of a space, they almost always are commutative. It's actually kind of hard to think of things that, that are associative but not commutative, um, or at least things with bounded space that are. So like string concatenation uh, is a monoid. Um, it is associative. It's not a commutative monoid. Um, anyway, groups that are commutative are abelian groups. That's the name for them. Um, and so, in general, the kind of things that we've seen that are related to max, that are generalizations of max, 
are monoids but are not groups, right? They're, 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 you can't reverse them. You can't invert the max operation. Um, and so you end up with things like hyperloglog -log or bloom filters and so on being monoids, um, and things like sums and averages and, and count min sketch being groups. And the importance in an analytics context of a group is that it lets you sort of roll things back, right? So to go back to that original Stripe example where we have these payments going through, what if there's a refund? Right? So we want to be able to have an, an inverse. Um, and, and if we have that inverse, you know, that refund coming down the stream, any of the sort of sums or averages or frequency counts and so on, we're, we're, we're going to be able to just combine that in and, and get the right answer. Um, but say if we're tracking you know, unique customers this way, um, we're not going to be able to roll that back. Right? So that's kind of a useful distinction to, to be able to understand. Um, and then the other point that I wanted to make is that um, these things end up sort of composing um, recursively in interesting ways, right? And so the example I gave you with count min sketch of that frequency monoid um, was itself using addition, right? So we, we, you know, we were finding the right slot in that matrix, and then once we found the right slot in that matrix, we were incrementing a counter, right? But what if the things in that matrix were not counters, but were like hyperloglog -log instances, right? And it turns out it would still work. Um, and so, you know, it, it, it's not any, not any monoid would work there. You have to have some kind of ordering because at the end when you do the query, you have to take the min. Um, but you can have basically a count min sketch of hyperloglogs, logs and, and that works, right? Or a histogram of hyperloglogs, logs or a histogram of count min sketches of hyperloglogs, logs or whatever, right? Um, and all of this stuff will still work and you can imagine, you know, building up interfaces and classes for this um, that let you compose these things in really nice ways. And and end up with, with the ability to have a very flexible and general system um, without having to sort of special case all of this stuff, right? So, so that's useful. Um, and so um, the, the, the only system that, that I know of that's open source that, that does um, a lot of this stuff in this way, thinking about it in these terms, is from Twitter. It's called Algebird. Um, it's in Scala. Um, and so for, for those of you who do use Scala, that's, that's a very worthwhile thing to look at. Um, for those of you who don't use Scala, I have this sort of semi-toy um, simmer that wraps Algebird in more of a kind of Unix text-based kind of command line um, interface. And, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's mostly a toy, though we do use it some in production at Stripe right now. Um, but I would welcome people looking at it and, and giving me feedback. Um, the other link, the other sort of reference link that I thought was useful to put up here is um, Aggregate Knowledge has a great blog um, where they do great sort of expositions of, of these kinds of algorithms and simulations of them, like they have a great hyperloglog -log JavaScript simulation and so on. Um, and so if any of what I've said is interesting, that's, that's a wonderful blog to go check out. Um, and apart from that, if there's any questions, I'm happy to take them. <laughs>